This episode contains content involving human sexuality with adult language and graphic descriptions of body parts located in the human pelvic area. This episode is not suitable for anyone under the age 18 and may not be suitable for all adult listeners. On the other hand, if listening to middle-aged suburban white guys talk about dirty books is your jam, well, you've come to the right place. It's the Paperback Warrior Podcast. Welcome to the 83rd episode of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. My name is Eric, and Paperback Warrior is our weekly show where we discuss genre fiction from the 20th century. The show is an outgrowth of our blog where we review old paperbacks daily at paperbackwarrior.com, so you'll never have the problem of wondering what you should read next. It's time to bring on my broadcast partner, Tom, to tell us what we're doing on today's episode. It sounds like a real doozy. Yeah, so thanks, Eric. So today we're going to discuss the evolution of sexual content in paperback genre fiction over the course of the 20th century. Embedded in that, there's going to be several segments and book recommendations. It's going to be like when you go to a Thai restaurant and they ask you how spicy you want it. We're going to discuss books at every level of that heat continuum. In keeping with that theme, I'm going to be reviewing a sexy mystery by author Carter Brown from 1958 called The Lover that has just been re-released by Starkhouse Books as part of a three-pack of mysteries starring the suburban L.A. police detective Al Wheeler. What is your review today, Eric? Today I'm going to be reviewing an adult Western paperback in the Spur series by Chet Cunningham. It's called Hang Spur McCoy. Okay, excellent. Now, before we get sexy, you discovered an author you wanted to tell uh, me about who wrote a lot of books across various genres. Tell me about what you discovered. Yeah, so Tom, weeks ago, which now seems like years ago, I started bagging my books, and I've occasionally brought up various discoveries I've been making going through all these books. So I found this stack of novels uh, that I started researching because I couldn't figure out who the authors were. I'm going to pass these over to you. Uh, take a look at these and tell the listeners the title of the books, the author's names, and maybe what they look like in, in terms of maybe genre. Eric's doing more exercise than he does in years trying to get these, uh, doing a sit-up basically to get this book out. He pulled a hammy. <laughs> he pulled Man. a hammy. Here. All right, so what Eric has just handed me is a book. It looks kind of like a science fiction fantasy type book called by Ardath Mayhar, A R D A T H space M-A-Y-H-A-R. First one is key to freedom, but key is spelled K-H-I. And then a, looks like a series book, uh, the Mountain Majesty book um, series. And that author's John Kildeer. The books he handed me were Wild Country and The Untamed. There's another uh, book uh, author named Francis Hurst, who wrote a epic account of survival in the untamed wilderness based on a true story called High Mountain Winter. And then a classic-looking Western called Bloody Texas Trail by Frank Cannon. There's hell to pay when an outlaw defends his honor. Eric, what do all these books have in common? So Frank Cannon, Francis Hurst, and John Kildeer are all pseudonyms for that first author that you mentioned, Ardath Mayhar. Hmm. So she had a bunch of names, and she had a lot of books throughout her career. And finding these books in my collection, I had to know more about her. So during a staff meeting at work, I was able to spend some quality time reviewing her life. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I love it. So she was born in Texas, and she lived from 1930 to 2012. Her full name is Ardath Francis Hurst Mayhar. It's kind of a mouthful. Yeah, I'll say. She authored a lot of books in various genres, most of which will appeal to our listeners. Uh, The first are her westerns. Uh, So as Frank Cannon, she wrote Feud at Sweetwater Creek, and the one that you had there, Texas Bloody Trail. These were 87 and 88. She also wrote the Western uh, you were holding called High Mountain Winter under the name Francis Hurst in 1996. Under her own name, she authored Westerns called Vendetta, Medicine Dream, Prescription for Danger, Born Rebel, and The Guns of Livingston... Let me say that again. Uh, the Guns of Livingston Frost. She also wrote juvenile Westerns, some of which are of a more modern variety, including... Medicine Walk, Timber Pirates, and The Absolute Perfect Horse. Uh, She was even nominated for a Spur Award. Uh, And there's an eight-book series of early pioneer novels called Mountain Majesty that piqued my interest. See what I did there, Tom? I like that. Mountain Majesty piqued my interest. Uh, Leave the comedy to the extras, please. 
dun, dun, dun. You've got two of them in your hands. It was published from 1992 to 1995 by Bantam. And these are all under that house name of John Kildeer. I think Mayhar wrote six of these, and I believe the other two were written by David Robbins. You know that guy? Oh, big time, yeah. Um, I read the first novel, Wild Country, last week, and I, and I really liked it. I think if you like David Robbins' Wilderness series or James Reasoner's Wagon West prequel books, you're going to love this one. Uh, Wild Country was written by Ardeth Mayhar. The book is set in 1810, and it's about a young man named Cleve Bennett who runs away from his abusive father and heads into the rugged Rocky Mountains to become a trapper and hunter. Basically, it's a a mountain man origin sort of story. Uh, It's here where he clashes with a rival trapper while also going through a rite of passage uh, to become a member of a Cherokee tribe. And this book sets up Bennett as the husband to a Cherokee female warrior as they raise their family in this, uh, you know, harsh wilderness. And some of these books are are on Kindle uh, for $3.50, including uh, this one, Wild Country. Uh, Mayhar also wrote a five-book series of prehistoric fiction that began with the 1995 novel Hunter of the Plains. I think these are like those... 1980s caveman books like clan of the cave bear yeah i remember yeah. those being all the rage back in the day i think daryl hannah was in one of the movies that she they, was yeah. yeah uh she also did three books of early ancestor fiction called people of the mesa and mayhar authored two books in the washington ship mystery series you ever read those no 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 name on them uh so that's about a texas police chief that solves uh random murders a third book was released after mayhar's death uh, but Tom, this author is mostly known for her fantasy and science fiction, and you know, just looking at the list here, uh, gosh, she's got like four or five series or trilogies of fantasy and sci-fi. She had sixty total novels, and a majority of it falls under those two genres. And she also had a lengthy list of short stories for all the various Digest magazines, and including Mike Shane Mystery Magazine. I'm going to read her sci-fi novel, uh, Key to Freedom, eventually, and from what I can gather. It's about a galactic servant that reminds me of Marvel's Silver Surfer character. Oh, that'd be neat. Yeah, so uh, anyway, that's my research on Ardeth Mayhar. You can buy a lot of her work affordably in digital, you know, for just a couple bucks. And there's two of those um, Mega Pack compilations from Wildside Press uh, that got maybe 20 or 30 of her stories in there. So, uh, so check it out. Well, that's great. And again, it's Ardath, A-R-D-A-T-H, Mayhar, M-A-Y-H-A-R. And thanks for sharing that. I knew nothing about her. Um, Eric, I happen to know that our listeners are way into sex, like disproportionate to the public at large. So we better get into our feature before all this sexual tension boils over. So play the transition music, please. All right, so we are talking about sexual content in the 20th century paperback genre fiction. And I think a good place to start is the idea that Americans have always had a very complicated relationship with sex and pop culture, and and one that's definitely evolved over time. Americans like sexual content, but they don't want anyone to know how much they like it. For example, it's no coincidence that the popularity of that Fifty Shades of Grey series from 2011 coincided with people beginning to read books on their Kindles. It eventually sold a lot of paperback copies, but the Kindle served as the plain brown wrapper that allowed otherwise proper housewives to get freaky without anyone else at the swim and tennis club Mm -hmm. knowing what they're reading. Yeah. I've been reading a history book called Two-Bit Culture, The Paperbacking of America by a historian named Kenneth C. Davis. And the book covers the evolution of mass market book publishing um, in the 20th century. This was his first book in 1984, and it's kind of a dry academic work that reads like a 427-page kind of dense book of historical scholarship. If the name Kenneth C. Davis rings a bell, it's because his second book from 1990 was a massive bestseller. It was called Don't Know Much About History, and it spent 35 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It answered questions about American history in a popular, easy-reading style with chapter headings like, Did Pocahontas really save John Smith's life? And then it's kind of a short essay answering that question. Anyway, I use 2-bit culture as a reference for this feature, just so I can give credit where credit is due. We've discussed this before, but it bears repeating. Before 1939, books were in hardcover, and they were very expensive. Owning books was a hobby and a pursuit of the upper class in America. 
Now, in 1939, the mass market paperback book, as we know it now, was invented. But for the first decade, publishers of paperbacks were really just reprinting hardcover books, and which was often literature of high esteem in this new paperback format that anyone could buy for 25 cents. So in that sense, paperbacks, if you think about it, really democratized novels and made them something that the working man or woman could afford. Now, it wasn't until 1949 that publishers began hiring authors to produce original novels in paperback for 25 cents. Now, the target market for these books were often men who had returned from World War II and wanted exciting books to read for 25 cents a pop. This stuff that you and I have a whole podcast and website about is really not high-minded literature at all. They're just exciting reads, and they're wrapped in these lurid, beautifully painted covers. Now, in the early 1940s, the publishing houses putting out these paperback books began to notice that the sexier the cover art was on these paperbacks, the more copies they sold. Now, this was often driven by publishers from the pulp magazines that were, who were jumping over into paperback publishing. Now, the pulps were always sexually suggestive, and they were literature for people of low esteem, like you and I, Eric. Mm-hmm. But as barbarian pulp publishers began migrating into the paperbacks during the 1940s, readers started seeing a different approach to the marketing and cover and cover art on classic novels. Now, here's a good example. The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett began its life as a serialized novel from the pages of Black Mask magazine. It starred Private Eye Sam Spade. Now, you guys are probably very familiar with the movie starring Humphrey Bogart, which is good, but you should also read the novel because it's excellent. So in 1944, Pocket Books released paperback edition of The Maltese Falcon with cover art showing just three hands reaching toward the Falcon statue with cover copy reading Sam Spade and the Black Bird. However, three years later, in 1947, a new illustration appeared on the cover. That one depicted a young woman getting undressed while a man sits on the other side of a sheer curtain, fondling her high heel shoe with a pair of panties draped across his leg. The cover copy from this edition read, Sam Spade searched each article of the girl's clothing. Mm. It's clear that between 1944 and 1947, there was a deliberate decision to sex up the book's appeal to the guys who've returned home from the war and have some disposable income as they're assimilating back into civilian life. Another example is this 1925 bestseller by John Erskine that sold over a half million hardcover copies. It was called The Private Life of Helen of Troy. When it was reprinted as a mass market paperback in 1948, Popular Library slapped an illustrated cover on the book where Helen of Troy is wearing a sheer toga, through which you could see her underwear and most notably her giant rack with rock hard erect nipples. The tagline read, Her lust caused the Trojan War. Mm. Have you seen that cover? I haven't, but it sounds fascinating. Here, let me turn this around. I want to show this to you. I have it on my computer screen here. Just, I mean, just look at this. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's practically naked. Yes. And um, yeah. No, wow. this this was this act. This was no accident. It was no coincidence. You see, what happened was Popular Library was established in 1942 by two guys who were major pulp magazine publishers. Makes sense. Now, the pulp guys knew how to sell books to horny dudes way better than the stuffy publishing houses did at the time. It's like a hardcover guy said to the pulp guys, we just sold 500,000 copies of this historical fiction novel about Helen of Troy, and the pulp guys were like, hold my beer. Yeah. Now, the divide in the publishing industry between these erudite literary types and the more pedestrian pulp fiction types was fierce. The 1940s began with paperbacks being praised for improving the literacy and providing a new market for writers. But by 1950, the image of paperback fiction was blackened by the sexual content on the covers, mostly because these barbarian pulp guys, the tradition you and I champion here, Eric, sent the business down that low. Low road. Mm. As the 1950s rolled around and paperback originals became the big craze, the obsession with sex on the covers 
rarely ever married up to the actual sexual content in the books themselves. Have you noticed that? Yes. So to be clear, these fictional characters, they were getting laid left and right, and the buildup always had heaving breasts and tight dresses and nudity, but nothing was ever described below the waist. And when it came time to have intercourse within the story, the scene always just fades to black and allows the reader's imagination to take over. Sometimes the concept of nudity was all it took to drive these dudes wild in the 1950s, while actual graphic descriptions of what happens when nude would have made them spontaneously combust. (laughs) If you just search the word nude on the paperbackwarrior.com search bar, we have Negative of a Nude by Charles Fritch, which was an ace double from 1958. Nude on Thin Ice by Gil Brewer from 1960. Dirge for a Nude by Jonathan Craig from 1953. Case of the Nervous Nude by Jonathan Craig from 1959. I had no idea we had that much nudity on our (laughs) our site. Who knew? Who knew? If we walked up and down the shelves of my library here in this room, we could probably find a dozen more uh, like books that just feature the idea of nudity. In uh, another very creepy and retrospect trope of the 1950s crime fiction was the idea of a grown-ass man being seduced by a precocious and horny teenage girl. Now, I read and reviewed a book, here I can hand this to you, um, called Kitten with a Whip by Wade Miller. It was written in 1959. It was later made into a movie starring Anne Margaret. It was a good book. Now, the tagline in the book was, She had a child's mind in a lush woman's body, and she reached for evil with both hands. The protagonist in the book is this paunchy 33-year-old San Diego suburbanite named David Patton. As the book opens, he's giddy with excitement at the possibilities of adventures that await while his wife and daughter are out of town on a trip. So his dream of an adventure begins to take focus when he awakens to find a hot 17-year-old chick wearing a nightgown prowling inside his house. We quickly learn that her name is Jody, and she's a runaway from the local girls' reformatory who broke into David's place looking for a change of clothing and somewhere to sleep. Now, instead of turning this young, sexy fugitive over to the authorities, David decides to show her some hospitality. And the central tension of this book's opening act is David basically playing chicken with his desire to have sex with this troubled teen. The interpersonal dynamic between the two, these two characters, the suburban schlub and this manipulative sex kit, and provides the novel's central tension. And their relationship evolves over the course of the weekend as David ties his life into knots to avoid his neighbors and family from finding out about this uninvited desk. Uh, The authors, uh, Wade Miller, uh, was actually a collaboration of two guys. They play with two central ideas, fear of women and fear of adolescence. The premise is that neither women nor adolescents are entirely rational, and one's use of logic and reason is a totally inadequate response to their innate impulsiveness. These are not themes that are going to play well in today's world, but they've really made for an interesting glimpse into the mindset of 1950s America in that, uh, in the, I thought it was a really compelling novel. It was a very sexy book, and it had a super taboo setup and, uh, that has no description of actual intercourse in the novel itself. Again, just as an example, this book's Kitten with a Whip by Wade Miller. I mentioned earlier this author, Jonathan Craig. His real name was Frank Smith. Let me hand these over to you. We did a very early feature about him, and you and I have a conversation we want to have on the air here at the podcast about some of his later work. I thought he was a wonderful writer. His most famous series of books were the Sixth Precinct novels, and they were police procedural starring NYPD detectives Pete Selby and Stan Rader. The setup of these early mysteries usually was the discovery of a naked, murdered woman, and the the detectives need to figure out why she's naked and why she's dead. He also wrote this book that I want to talk about right now called So Young, So Wicked. It was a Fawcett Gold Medal novel from 1957. The cover of the book had two variants, each with an attractive teenage girl lying on her back, and the tagline, Meet Later, The Dainty Town Beauty at 15, and getting her kicks out of men and murder. Now, you look at this book cover, and I just handed it to you, and it appears to be like the hottest jailbait story ever based on the cover. 
But there's some things you need to know about So Young, So Wicked. One, it was awesome. It was one of the best paperbacks I've ever read. Two, it's being reprinted in April 2021 as a mass market paperback with the original cover art by Black Gat Books. It's available for pre-order on Amazon. Check it out. So Young, So Wicked by Jonathan Craig. And three, it's actually not about a guy banging a 15-year-old tramp. It's about a hitman named Garrity who's assigned to kill an impo- this impossibly beautiful 15-year-old girl named Leda who lives in a small town in upstate New York. What complicates matters in this book is the, this order that Garrity must make Leda's death look like an accident. Therefore, a rifle shot to her uh, teeny bopper jailbait bedroom window is, is just a no-go. Garrity has no clue why the mafia wants this pretty teen murdered and his uh, bosses aren't telling him. He just needs to know that he's a dead man if he fails to make the hit, so he goes up uh, upstate. The template for So Young, So Wicked is really similar to Max Allen Collins' excellent Quarry series. Leda, the teen, Leda or Leda, uh, she's quite a seductress. And to the extent that uh, I think the character named Leda Louise Nolan may actually be a hat tip to the female lead of Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita. At the heart of the paperback is Garrity trying to unravel this mystery of why the syndicate wants this teenage girl killed. Now, this vintage cover art, though, provides this misleading romantic impression to the reader when the reality is that what we're talking about here is just a very seriously dark and violent paperback. Uh, listeners, you guys should get a copy of this book from Black Gat next month. It's, it's really something else. It's called So Young, So Wicked by Jonathan Craig. So let's move forward in time. So the 1960s roll around, and the sexual content of these genre paperbacks really gets turned up a notch. But at no point does it ever actually enter the idea of full-fledged porn. And so one of the biggest publishers of sleaze fiction was a company called Nightstand Books. According to collector and paperback historian Lynn Monroe, Nightstand was launched in Illinois in 1959 by a guy named William Hamling. And their titles in, of nightstand books, they got right to the point, like Sex Gang, Sin Girls, and they sold a lot of copies. They were so successful that their imprints spun off to other imprints, including Leisure Books. So during the 1960s, nightstand books actually took the time to seek out excellent writers for their sex novels, and they commissioned great illustrators to do the covers. Listen to this lineup of authors who got their start writing sex novels for nightstand, almost all using pseudonyms. Robert Silverberg, Harlan Ellison, Lawrence Block, Donald Westlake, Evan Hunter, who later wrote as Ed McBain, Marion Zimmer Bradley, and John Jakes. Most of these guys were represented by the Scott Meredith Literary Agency, who also provided the talent, often these exact guys, for Manhunt Magazine. Now, I read one of these nightstand books. It was called Sin Hellcat by Andrew Shaw. Now, Andrew Shaw was a house name used by multiple nightstand authors, but this particular book, Sin Hellcat, was written in 1961, and the cover illustration depicts a naked woman drinking directly from a wine bottle while the young man next to her looks like he's really got his hands full with this girl. I gravitated to this book for two reasons. One, it's available today as a cheap ebook, and two, in this case, Andrew Shaw was a collaboration of Lawrence Block and Donald Westlake two of my favorite authors. The book itself is about a guy named Harvey who's living this mundane, split-level suburban existence with a frigid wife and a mid-level Manhattan executive, advertising executive job. He likes to remember his college years when he was like sexual and young with his, uh, in in basically a lover with his girlfriend, Jody. The novel's opening treats the reader to the generous flashbacks from Harvey's college years when he and Jody were first exploring one another sexually and later when he was trying to get laid at the ad agency when he was a mailroom clerk. There are a lot of very sexy but at no point overly graphic scenes that comprise the first half of the book and also serve as character development. In the present day of the novel, Harvey reconnects with Jody, who's now a high-end prostitute. After spending the night at Jody's place, Harvey's awakened by a goon with a camera and a blackmail proposition. I'm not going to give it away, but I was happy to read that both uh, Lawrence Block and Donald Westlake chose to add some intrigue and muscle to the sexy mix with a plot involving an international smuggling ring. I'm a huge fan of both Lawrence Block and Donald Westlake, and I really had fun reading this early collaboration before they made it big. There were sections of the novel where I could actually recognize each of their narrative voices when they were tadpoles. 
Is Sin Hellcat a masterpiece? No, but it's way better than a 1961 sex paperback deserves to be. There's enough titillation to keep the dudes flipping the pages and enough edgy, adventurous content to add some substance to the book. Meanwhile, the writing styles are pretty excellent and genuinely funny and insightful at times. It's not a top-tier Lawrence Block or Westlake book, but it's a nice way to kill a few hours, and I, I recommend it. But again, there's no actual vivid description of actual sex happening anywhere in this book. And this is a paperback from a sex book publisher in the 1960s. So during the 1960s, we're talking about adult book publishing houses, and they are still keeping the sexual descriptions inside the books really soft core. Now, the reason descriptions of sex were being soft sold during this era was because there were still obscenity laws on the books across America and Europe. Between 1950 and 1969, there was a Louisiana native and a World War II veteran named John Burton Thompson, and he authored and sold around 75 books. His paperbacks were considered to be so racy at the time that the NYPD raided city bookstores and seized over a thousand copies of paperbacks written by Thompson and others. Thereafter, much of his writing was done using pseudonyms so he could remain marketable to these skittish booksellers. But again, I've read a couple of his books, and by today's cultural standards, the sex in even Thompson's work wouldn't raise an eyebrow. Lee Goldberg has a new publishing imprint called Cutting Edge Books that's reprinted a couple of Thompson's 1962 paperbacks, Kiss or Kill and Swamp Nymph. I read and reviewed both of them at paperbackwarrior.com. I thought Thompson was a really good writer in both books. I liked Kiss or Kill, but I didn't like Swamp Nymph. In both cases, the sex scenes in these books were nothing by today's standards, yet this guy was targeted by the NYPD as a pornographer. That's crazy to think, isn't it? Yeah. So in the late 1960s and early 1970s, publishers were pushing the boundaries of sexually explicit materials in paperback genre fiction, And this guy who owned uh, Nightstand Books, Mr. Hamling, he moved to California. Hamling and his business partner were later sent to federal prison by the Nixon administration on pornography charges. And this is a guy who gave a start to so many of my favorite authors. And he was sent to prison for soft core paperbacks. Let that sink in for a minute. Isn't that crazy to think? It's an actual prison. Jeez. So the question everyone should be asking is, what changed? Why did paperback fiction become way more graphic in the 1970s? Um, and, and then the FBI stopped locking up writers who were making 2000 bucks a book. The answer to that question is that in 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court made a landmark decision in a case called Miller versus California. Now, prior to that Supreme Court decision, the definition of obscenity in the courts used to be any work, quote, without socially redeeming value. It's pretty vague. They're totally vague. And the Miller case, though, in 1973, changed all that. The new definition of obscenity became anything that lacked serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, which still seems like an overreach to <laughs> yes. me, but, um, but it was way better than the old way. The courts also said that law enforcement needed to apply what they called community standards to defining obscene materials. But the key thing that got everybody off the hook was the idea that any book could be argued to have even the slightest redeeming social importance would then have First Amendment protections. Now, for paperback houses, the gloves were off to begin describing sex scenes in graphic detail. Again, and if you think about it, 1973, take a look at that copyright. From that date on, you began seeing a lot of hardcore sex in books. Men's adventure novels featuring vigilantes began seeing heroes getting laid in graphic detail. This entire industry of adult westerns popped up with the the trailsmen, Slocum and Longarm, banging everything that moved except for their horses. World War II fighting men like Clarence J. Mahoney, the star of the excellent Sergeant series written by Len Levinson under the pseudonym of Gordon Davis, would pause their gunfighting during their fictionalized liberation of Paris to have X-rated sex with a French girl. Max Allen Collins began writing excellent graphic sex scenes sprinkled into his quarry books about a Vietnam vet turned into hitman for hire. Every one of these authors and their paper book publishing houses made these books what they were without fear of imprisonment or fines. None of this would have happened if it weren't for that 1973 Supreme Court decision, Eric. There were graphic sex books before 1973, but the authors, publishers, and booksellers bringing those books to market 
did so at tremendous legal risk to themselves. After 1973, they could do what they wanted. The rules changed. So, Eric, on a show a few years ago, you said that you weren't a fan of graphic sex scenes in genre fiction. Have your thoughts on that evolved over time? And where do you fall on the non-graphic erotic scenes that worked their way into genre fiction in the 1950s and 60s? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, That's a good question. Um, I love the seduction aspect and, like, the big tease, right? I love how these mid-20th century authors could set a sexy mood without going X-rated, or even in some cases not even going R-rated. Like Guys like Charles Williams and, and Gil Brewer, I thought, could just do that really, really well. I agree. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, I like the idea of imagination over the explicitly detailed scene. So let me ask you a question. Have you seen the 1978 uh, film Halloween? Yeah, sure, of course. Right. Did you realize there isn't really a single drop of blood in the entire film? Yeah, a, I never, never thought about it. I considered it to be an incredibly violent slasher film. There's a red scratch on Laurie Strode on her arm, and that's it. And so, to me, that speaks volumes because Carpenter is able to create this, this terrifying film without any blood. Uh, he uses music. He uses the slower pace. He uses the sound effects, like groans or the really heavy breathing. But he allows the viewers just to imagine how awful the stabbing and slicing is. And for me, I don't really need the entire description of intercourse to visualize that these characters in these books are really into each other. And frankly, I just I'm a prude. (laughs) I just skip over the explicit pages. Um, They don't do anything for me to 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 improve the story or make it better. I agree. I don't I don't mind a graphic sex scene um, at all. It doesn't bother me. But but I, I do think that that kind of hot seduction stuff is way better. In fact, that book that we both read, uh, Kill Now, Pay Later by Robert Kyle. Yes. It's one of those Ben Gates mysteries. That was yeah. one of the most erotic scenes <laughs> yes. I've ever seen at, that, uh, at the wedding when he gets seduced. And mm-hmm. so I, I, I tend to agree with you. I want to run something by you. With your permission, I want to segue directly into my book review. It would normally be your turn to talk because I have a story to tell that ties directly into the feature we just talked about. And then we'll circle back and do your feature. Is that cool? I'll allow it. All right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> now, the book I'm reviewing this week is The Lover by Carter Brown. Now, under the pseudonym of Carter Brown, Alan Jeffrey Yates, who lived from 1923 to 1985, authored 215 novels and 75 novellas, and he actually counted U.S. President John F. Kennedy among his fans. His most enduring character is this California-based police detective named Al Wheeler. And Starkhouse Press has just released another three-pack of Wheeler mysteries anchored by The Lover, a book from 1958. The other books in the new trade paperback are The Mistress and The Passionate, all, all by Carter Brown. In this case, Detective Al Wheeler is dispatched to by the sheriff to investigate a loony cult in the mountains run by a dude who calls himself The Prophet. His followers allegedly engage in sun worship, group sex, drugs, fertility ceremonies. The sheriff's concerned that the screwball religions may br- somehow break bad in some unforeseen manner and orders Wheeler to investigate and provide his assessment. Now, Wheeler heads to the mountains to watch this prophet guy in action. The cult leader is tan and muscular, and he all walks around wearing nothing but a loincloth, and, and he seems to worship the sun without any metaphor or irony. The prophet's spiel is pretty pro forma until he starts preaching that the sun god demands a sacrifice. Now, it's a Carter Brown book, and it wouldn't be much of a murder mystery if no one got killed. As such, we meet the cadre of pro- the prophet's devotees, We finally get a murder for Wheeler to solve. The author introduces a a lot of characters, probably too many characters, who are all regarded as suspects. Uh, Wheeler's way more full of wisecracks than I recall from his other installments. I think that probably has something to do with Shell Scott's popularity around the same time in 1958. Um, Beyond that, it's pretty standard whodunit mystery. Colorful characters, logical, satisfying conclusion. I like Carter Brown mysteries. They're always sort of satisfying characters. pulp comfort food, I guess, a palate cleanser between more substantial novels. You totally always know what you're getting with a Carter Brown book, and the thin paperbacks always deliver the goods. Uh, The Lover was no exception. You'll know exactly what you're getting, and it's a good time. I recommend it. But here's where it gets weird, and this is the point I wanted to make that ties into our feature. So the Starkhouse volume here, I'm going to hand this over to you, is this beautiful trade paperback with nice, sexy, illustrated cover. The Carter Brown book sold over 100 million copies, and nearly every title went through many different printings with many different cover variations. 
Now, I have a decent-sized Carter Brown collection. I know you do, too. And I happen to have a, another copy the, um, of The Lover. Take a look at this. This, this printing of The Lover is a double, published by Signet, and it pairs The Lover with another Al Wheeler mystery from 1957 called The Bombshell. Now, this double, printed by Signet in my hand that I'm holding up for you here in 1980, has this cheesy photo cover of stock pics with sexy babes in various states of undress. What do you think of this cover, the one from uh, the reprint here? I really dislike those, and I have a bunch of them. Uh, yeah. I prefer the vivid paintings much, much better. I agree. I don't like this cover variant either, but I really wanted to read The Lover for this review, and reading the 1980 reprint in my hand allowed me to preserve this beautiful uh, Starkhouse 2021 reprint of the same novel, um, because I tend to beat up paperbacks pretty bad and uh, when they're in my back pocket or my laptop bag. So you're following this so far. So yes. so the, we have an old version of the book, and the, or rather the, 19, the 2021 reprint by Starkhouse, then I have this old 1980s one. Specifically, 1980. And so, see, you're following this, right? You're reading a book called The Lover from 1958, but you're choosing to read the 1980 reprinting rather than the new 2021 printing from Starkhouse. Bingo. You got it. Exactly. This is important. So follow my logic. All right. So I'm reading this novel. It's fine. Detective Al Wheeler is doing his 1958 things. When all of a sudden, Wheeler gets laid. Uh, Also not unusual. It happens in every book. But out of nowhere in Chapter 2, I read this passage. And, uh, and, and I want you to pardon my graphic content here. I'm actually driving to a point. It says, We made love on the couch quickly, urgently. She lay beneath me, her legs drawn back, as I plunged my ramrod, hard organ, to the hilt of her labia, so that I filled her, completely engorged her. She gasped and strained, and her fingernails sharply raked my back. Her body threshed and bucked up against mine. Harder, harder, she cried. Jesus! Now, the scene goes on on from there, Eric. You get the idea. I was shocked because I read enough books from 1958 to know that it was decades before ramrods and labia were even invented. I knew something was weird, so I checked out the new Starkhouse edition of the same book. And sure enough... There were no graphic sex scenes whatsoever in the Starkhouse version of the book. So I reached out for Greg Shepard of Starkhouse, the owner, and he said that the Starkhouse version is, in fact, the original version as written by Alan Yates, who was writing as Carter Brown. Then I referred to the introduction of the very first Starkhouse collection of three Carter Brown books starring Al Wheeler. It's called the, the Wench is Wicked, and it has this introduction by Chris Yates, the author's son. Now, in his introduction, he said that his father's Carter Brown books were titillating. The girls were always glamorous and well-endowed and ready to have a good time for one reason or another, and most of the covers featured semi-clad models with the promise of more to come. Alan Yates, writing as Carter Brown, wrote the sex scenes with a light touch and good taste. But the later books had a more graphic sexual element to them that were introduced by the editors at New American Library, the parent company of Signet, who was the publisher of the dirty version that I read. Mm -hmm. So this addition of graphic sex scenes didn't always sit well with the author, um, the son said. But Eric, it's not just adding sex scenes where they otherwise faded to black. There's more. I'm handing you the Starkhouse version there. You got it in your hands. And I want to read you, I want you to read the very last paragraph from the original novel, The Lover, as it appeared in 1958 and was reprinted by Starkhouse. I'm going to then read the exact same paragraph as it was dirtied up by editors at Signet Books. In the uh, paragraph that you have there in your hands, let's change the woman's name to Vanessa so we don't spoil the solution to the mystery, okay? Okay. You read that paragraph as it appeared in the original one and the Starkhouse reprint, and I, then I'll read the same paragraph just to do, compare apples to apples. So go ahead. You do your thing. Okay. Your wife is not anywhere near the door, right? No, we're cool. I don't want her to think there was something weird going on in here. All right. So uh, I walked into the bedroom and stretched out on the bed. I could hear the comforting hiss of soda from the living room. A few moments later, I watched Vanessa walk into the room with the drinks. I didn't have to be back at the office until Wednesday. Who needed 80 grand? Okay, so that was the original version. Let me read you the 1980 edit. I walked into the bedroom, stripped right down to nothing, and stretched out on the bed. I could hear the comforting hiss of soda from the living room. And a few minutes later, I watched Vanessa walk stark naked into the room with the drinks. 
I didn't have to be back to the office until Wednesday, my prick began to stir at the sight of her. Who needed 80 grand? Eric, what, what is your reaction to this corporate edit of uh, this author's work? All right, so two things. Yeah. First, man, this is like a high school boner stuff. I mean, it just seems immature and lazy. My prick began to stir. I mean, come on, man. Well, second... I feel like this is now fake. Like, like this is a fake. The author never intended for this to be in the book, right? It's like, it's like you going back and adding seven string guitars to a Jimi Hendrix album. He never played seven strings and wouldn't want it tarnishing his sound in his album, right? I mean, it's kind of the same thing. I, I agree. I, I think that the, I mean, the original Carter Brown books were sexy, titillating mysteries. They didn't need to be helped along by some corporate editor adding in pricks and labias that weren't even in the original manuscript. Moreover, I'm a guy who likes a good sex scene. There's something actually sexier to me about the 1958 version of a seduction happening that fades to black. My mind can fill in the blanks. I just, I, in reading Al Wheeler books, I, I don't see Al Wheeler, uh, uh, I don't see him saying that to me. Me neither. No, There's I mean, just no he, way. He wasn't, I mean, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's totally outside of his personality. Yeah, I, it made no sense to me that Signet made that choice. Um, and, yeah. uh, and, and, and hats off to Starkhouse for actually printing the original version of the book as it appeared back when it was written, as opposed to being lazy and just yeah. kind of printing, reprinting the 1980 version, which to me is just sort of gross. I tried to find, uh, I was looking around today, and I just cannot find the quote, but there's a, an awesome quote out there that Louis L'Amour made. Maybe you've heard of it. Somebody asked him, why don't you have sex in your westerns? Like, that's all the rage here in the 80s yeah. um, at the time. And he said something really cool, like, like some authors need that to, to gain readership. I don't need that to build to build a readership or to have my characters, uh, you know, become prevalent, so to speak. He goes, I just don't need it. So, yeah. so he just doesn't have any sex in his books. It's interesting. So anything else on this topic, or do you want to just go launch into your sexy uh, Western review? Yeah, I was going to say my review is going to kind of go right, right along with yeah, it. Yeah, go with it. Do it. All right, so I'm going to review the 15th entry of the adult Western series, Spur. See what I did there with the entry? Okay, that's too far. <laughs> <laughs> there are over 40 books in this series, and they're all written by Chet Cunningham under the pseudonym Dirk Fletcher, which sounds like a porn name in itself. Yeah. Uh, the quick idea behind this series, if you're not familiar with it, is that Spur McCoy was a captain in the U.S. Civil War, and he was appointed as one of the very first U.S. Secret Service agents. He's excellent with a horse, and he's a highly skilled marksman with a pistol. After exceptional service in Washington, he's transferred to St. Louis to manage all the action west of the Mississippi. Thus, a series is born with a legitimate character, purpose, and the open-ended ability to really kind of place him in any sort of drama and adventure in the perilous west. And as, a, and as Louis the Moore suggests, if the action is west of the Mississippi, then it's truly a western. So in the beginning of the book, Spur is in the middle of a firefight. He gets shot in the leg, and then he awakens to find he's surrounded by a sheriff and his three makeshift deputies. And they, they immediately accuse him of rape and murder. And, uh, you know, Spur has no idea what they're talking about. He just woke up. Uh, the sheriff wisens, uh, uh, wisens up and deems Spur is completely innocent. He didn't do anything. And just calls off the lynching. But this trio of deputies are so horny for a hanging that uh, they're just, they, they just have to do it. So the sheriff does this little fake noose thing, and he hangs Spur to please the deputies. But once they all ride off, the sheriff helps Spur down, and Spur rides off to not only find the three guys that hung him, but also to track down a counterfeiter in Twin Falls, Idaho. Now, Cunningham cuts a few corners, and he has one of the hangmen directly related to this counterfeit operation. It's convenient. Um, as Spur plays detective to find the counterfeiter and his operation... He's doing the naughty. Uh, he beds down several lovely ladies in triple X fashion. I yeah. mean, everything's detailed. It's an adult Western. Yes, and then, then there's no holds barred, and it's a group, and it's just, it's just wild. Uh, but again, you know, it's adult Western, and about, what did I say, about 10% of the narrative um, in this book had to include sex scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, but the book has this awesome finale as Spur is unarmed, and he's fighting the outlaws in the forest. He even shows this really rare, compassionate side with one of the bad guys, which... I thought it was a really neat nuance, uh, nuance that uh, Cunningham displayed in his writing style. Overall, this is a really great Western novel and uh, probably a real highlight of the series. Tom, you read this book too because I remember when we first met, you suggested I borrow this and read it. Yeah, no, I uh, I like the Spur series. I think this is the best installment in it. Um, I mean, they're not brilliant, but they're uh, they're they're good adult westerns. And Chet Cunningham was a real talent, man. That guy was a workhorse. Yeah.
So uh, that's a show. Uh, we hope all the sex talk didn't get you all hot and bothered. After you take your cold shower, we invite you to visit paperbackwarrior.com uh, for new reviews of old books. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Bumble for daily content and to join in the conversation. Review us on iTunes. Donate to the show on PayPal. Watch your simple carbs. Stay hydrated. Lift with your knees, not with your back. Get that colonoscopy. And check out the show next week. On behalf of Eric, this is Tom saying, be cool. <laughs>